So welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's CRO Career Conversations. My name is Vivian Doling, and I serve as Vice President of Emerging Company Development at the North Carolina Biotechnology Center. I co-lead the NC CRO Collaborative with my colleague, Laura Raleigh. While North Carolina is a leader in clinical research, career opportunities in the field remain elusive to many. Through this event series, we'll be inviting professionals from the CRO industry and research sites to speak candidly about their own experiences and provide more information about the many rewarding careers that exist. We recommend using Zoom's gallery view during tonight's conversations to allow you to see all of our speakers. While attendees are muted to avoid potential disruptions, we encourage you to submit questions throughout on the Q&A function. There's also an option to upvote questions. If you see someone else submitting a question that you're also interested in, give it a thumbs up. We'll be devoting the last 30 minutes to answering your questions and we'll prioritize those with the most likes. So without further delay, I'll turn it over to our monitor Jamie Langley to introduce herself and to kick off tonight's conversation about early careers in clinical research. There we go. I was magically muted. Um, thank you, Vivian. I'm Jamie Langley and I'm joining you from the big town of Wendell, North Carolina. I've been working in clinical research for over 20 years um, in a variety of roles, be it at the site, working with sponsors, which we'll learn a bit more about, or CROs, as well as in academic settings. Since 2008, I've been working with ParXL, a contract research organization, or CRO, and today I'm the global head of ParXL Academy. So the topic of early career and how to break into the industry is absolutely something near and dear to my heart. Over the course of this session, there are going to be some things that you hear that you may not be familiar with, some terminology that we might use pretty nonchalantly. So I want to clarify just a couple of those for you to help ease the way through tonight's session. When you hear the word sponsor, that refers to the company or the institution that's responsible for pulling together and managing and or financing a clinical trial. If you think about the COVID-19 vaccines, Moderna would be considered a sponsor. You might hear the word CRO as you have already. That's an organization like mine, ParXL or Senios. Farpoint Research, that is an organization contracted by a pharmaceutical, biotech, or medical device company to actually conduct elements of the clinical trial. There's various roles that we'll talk about this evening as well. CRA, or Clinical Research Associate, is the individual who's overseeing the progress of a clinical trial and ensuring that it's conducted, recorded, and reported appropriately. And there's a lot of rules around that. Typically, those are traveling positions. So these individuals will go to different sites or institutions. We'll also hear about a project specialist or a project team associate. Those are individuals that work diligently to support the project management aspects and the operations team members on a clinical trial. Oftentimes, they're focusing heavily on timelines, budgets, and overall delivery. If you hear any terms that you're not familiar with, don't hesitate to put them into the chat and we'll, we'll cover them. Make sure that you understand where we're going. Tonight, I am thrilled to be joined with three fabulous panelists, and they're going to be sharing their experiences and answering your questions about their roles and our industry. Kristen, would you kick us off by introducing yourself? Sure thing. Uh, Kristen Alance, Project Specialist with the CRO, Clinical Contract Research Organization, Cineos Health, and I'm located within the Morrisville, North Carolina area. Awesome. Grace? 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Grace Langley, and I'm a clinical research associate at Par Excel International, and I'm located in Wendell, North Carolina, which is southeast of Raleigh. <laughs> and Victoria. Hi, my name is Victoria Elder. I'm a PDA or project team associate at Farpoint Research, and I am based out of Wilmington, North Carolina. Oh, making me jealous for the beach, Victoria. I know. It's a great place to live. Oh, my goodness. So I'm very curious um, and would love to hear briefly from each of you. How did you discover the clinical research field? Kristen? Yeah. Um, awesome. I found it through working at a staffing agency supporting clinical research recruiters. So ah, interesting. that's how I figured it out. Mm -hmm. We staffed uh, clinical trial associates and CRAs. So it wasn't something you went to school and said, I'm going to be a CRA oh. when I grow up, or I'm going to be a project specialist when I grow up. Not at all. Right? I actually grew up in North Carolina and didn't really know the industry until I moved back after college. All right, very good. All right, Grace. So funny enough, um, I don't know if anyone noticed, but Jamie Lingley is also my mother. <laughs> um, so I actually was introduced to the clinical research industry through her um, way back in the day. Um, she started off working as a study coordinator on site and then eventually moved into the clinical research associate role within a clinical research organization. And within the last two years of my college career, I think that she was very heavily recruiting me to go into the industry. And so I actually was introduced to a, an executive um, within Park Cells, um, within Par the Park Cells company. And I babysat for her children. <laughs> and she actually said, if you ever want a job, let me know. And um, my first interview was for her admin assistant, so. Awesome, and Victoria. Well, similar backstory, both of my parents work in clinical research. So my dad's on the manufacturing production side of things. And my mom actually works at a CRO as well. So I definitely grew up in the industry. Started out going down the pre-med track, but similar to Grace, my mom kind of pushed me towards the CRA role or not CRA, CRO industry. All right, very good, very good. All right, so I'm gonna ask a few of you a few very pointed questions. All right, and Victoria, I'm gonna start with you, but it's how did you get this first job, okay? And, and really think about what suggestions that you could offer to individuals, where to look, how to network, or, or any other advice or tips you might be able to provide to the group. Absolutely, so I was very lucky and fortunate and had opportunities uh, to start my career in the CRO industry as a high school student. So I started out as a staff programming intern oh, when wow. I was a junior in high school. And from there, you know, I was working as a CNA as well, but you know, I really felt drawn to the CRO world mm -hmm. industry. So from there, it was just going through different departments, finding what I liked, what suited me, my personality best. And, you know, I would highly recommend going through LinkedIn and other various platforms, Glassdoor, to see what interests you, any available internships. I really press strongly on internships. They really helped me with my growth throughout the industry. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Now, Kristen, I know I, I asked, you know, Victoria earlier, she didn't go out and go to college and say, I want to be a project specialist, or I want to be a CRA, what's your background, like your educational background, and were you specifically looking for this type of role, or did it just happen? I knew I like project-based work, um, but I actually went to school for business management and marketing, not really knowing business degrees are very broad, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my internships were within marketing and hospitality. Uh, cause I know I like serving people and mm -hmm. being, you know, it's kind of that project based mentality, right. uh, but that was kind of my background. And then again, I learned about the field when I was doing, uh, the 
clinical staffing recruitment job, assisting them. And it just kind of happened. Awesome. Now, would you agree that there's likely what we would call transferable skills, right? Oh, yeah. From other things that you've done, like working at the staffing company or things that you did in school that finally they click, right? And you can see, oh, this applies easily to this project-based work, right? Exactly. My, like communication, I think is a huge one because you're not only talking to your internal team, sponsors, uh, principal investigators or mm -hmm. our PIs on studies, everyone requires a different level of communication. And so having, you know, these face or <laughs> these face to face meetings or virtual meetings, you have to be adaptable and organized. So anything is really transferable where you put it. Absolutely. Great. So Grace, I, I want you to sort of talk to us about this application and interview process, but also when you're, when you're speaking about it, think too about these transferable skills um, and whether that was something that came up in your interview process. Absolutely. So again, I, like Kristen, I don't have a STEM background. I actually have a degree in psychology and sociology. And so I believe that having a degree in the social sciences actually sets me apart from a lot of applicants because that allows me to really develop those soft skills that Kristen was mentioning earlier on, because I believe that during the application and interview process, they weren't really looking for me to know absolutely everything that there is to know about the clinical research industry. They're really looking for your growth potential and your ability to take the tools and resources and knowledge that they give you and turn it around into productivity and success within the industry. And so I believe when I first started, I, as I already mentioned, I applied for the admin assistant role for a VP within the company. And they actually said, well, you know, we actually have uh, an application open for the clinical operations assistant role. Why don't you interview for that one as well? And I was like, you know what? Send it to me. I'll take whatever you want to get me. <laughs> um, so I also interviewed for the clinical operations assistant role with a recruiter first and then moved on to um, a manager so that they could interview me as well. And I was offered both positions and ended up deciding to go with the clinical operations assistant role instead because it had more opportunities for um, promotion and growth within the company, which we will go into more detail later on. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So it's not always a, you know, a single pathway of entry, right? Um, so Victoria, very curious when you were going through your interview process and, and sort of interviewing employers, what were you as an employee looking for in a company? I was definitely looking for a company where I could grow myself as a mm -hmm. person and also my career. So I was li really looking for a company that would help me flourish as an individual and be accommodating, because I am still a student, so I needed that accommodation with my schedule and that flexibility. So luckily, Farpoint offered everything that I could ask for with that. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Now, this is probably the hardest question that anyone's going to be asked tonight. And Kristen, it's all yours. Tell me about your typical or average day. That question kills me. Um, <laughs> It, it varies, you know, it does vary, but I will give like the basics, a lot of my, and probably more weekly, monthly, things like that. But weekly, you know, it's running reports, it is transcribing meetings, it is um, attending internal sponsor and functional, we call them functional department meetings, just to make sure everything's on track. It's uh, forecasting financials. All of that sounds like a lot, but a lot of it, you know, and kind of what Jamie was mentioning as a project specialist, we're touching every piece of the puzzle within our study that we need to make sure everything's kind of operating correctly. And I'll kind of give an example today of how you have to be a little flexible. I just got hit with an audit prep for next month. So while all of my daily tasks will still be done, that kind of free time or, you know, most flexible time now has to be shifted so I can focus now on audit prep. But once October is done, I'll go back to that flexible time. Got it. So basically there is no such thing as a typical day. 
No, really. The best thing I can tell you is that you will have your consistence of, you know, sending a report, maybe Monday, Wednesday, your meetings that are every Tuesday, every Friday, but okay. some of it, you had to be a little flexible. Very good. Very good. All right. So on that same theme, Greg, what are some of your primary responsibilities and give us some examples of that. Apologies for the cat in the background. <laughs> um, my primary responsibilities, I feel like I am responsible for everything. I mean, the, the <laughs> clinical research associate is really the boots on the ground. Um, so I am the one that's going on site and I am reviewing all of the source data that's been collected from the subject visits, verifying the data that's been entered into the link. Uh, uh, yes, Jamie. What is source data? Oh, source data. Source data is everything that all documentation related to subject visits. It's, if they write it down on a sticky note, it counts. <laughs> I mean, we prefer not to have sticky notes, but you know, we doctors, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but yes, so we do review all source data um, to make sure that what was um, to verify what was completed during the visit and who was responsible for doing what and was it done according to the protocol. And then we also verify all data that was entered into, into the electronic data capture system, which is where we enter data to be, um, to be I guess, uh, analyzed for the study and come up with the project results. Um, and then I also am working on IP accountability. So making sure that the investigational product or drug that we're testing or device that we're testing is being accounted for. It was given to the right subject. We have enough on site. It's been stored properly, everything from you know X um, A to Z. And then I'm also going through the investigator site files. So what's the investigator site file? We are looking at all of the documents that show are the site staff uh, qualified in order to conduct the trial? Have they been properly trained? Um, are they maintaining documentation of IP dispensation? It's everything. So it, it's a lot. And that's what I'm doing when I'm traveling and going from site to site. I mean, just this week, I was in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And next week, I'll be in Rochester. And woof, there's the cat. <laughs> I'll be all over the place. Um, when I'm not on site um, monitoring, I am working remotely from home managing the sites and I am their primary point of contact between um, the site staff and the sponsor. So if they have any questions or concerns, they come to me first. And so that is a huge responsibility because if they don't have me, where are they going to get the answers, right? Um, so I am their main point of contact if they have any emergencies or questions or things of that nature. Got it. Okay, so I'm what? tired now. Is anybody else? <sighs> yeah. I remember those days. Yes, there, there's more. Well. I could go on all day, but we're not. That's going okay. To. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I think everybody's probably tired. So Victoria, I know from, from hearing from Kristen and from hearing from Grace, they're talking to team members, investigators, or the doctors that are doing the studies. They're talking to study nurses or people at the site that are helping conduct the studies. What types of interactions do you have in your role with other colleagues, team members at Farpoint, or even with patients or subjects that are participating in clinical trials? Absolutely. So I don't have any direct subject contact out of my role, but I do communicate heavily in within Farpoint and to the sponsor, as Chris was saying, um, and sites, as Grace was saying. But Within Farpoint and internally to colleagues, uh, we have a study team, so I communicate with the study team, our project manager, our COL. Um, I communicate with the statisticians, stack programmers, data management, you know, kind of coordinating everything and making sure everyone's on the same page and that everyone's updating things at appropriate times. Okay, so so based on what you said, and I know you, you kind of threw in um, the acronym COL, that's a clinical operations leader, right, or, or clinical lead. They're, they're sort of the primary point of contact for the clinical team, like the clinical research associate, like what Grace is, is that right? Correct, yeah, our COL, I kind of would think to then as the line manager for the CRA. Okay. So the CRAs would report any findings, any reports to the COLs, and the COL will take it from there. Okay. And I also heard that you're working with the biostatistics team, the data management team. So in your project specialist, or, or um, correct me if it's the wrong term, 
It's project specialist, right? Project team associate. Project team associate. Um, you're really working cross-functionally to support that project. Is that right? Absolutely. And I've also had history in programming and the BioSP role, so the biostatistics role. So I also help out anywhere I can there. So I'm not just working in clinical. I'm allowed to dip my toe in other places when needed. Got it. Got it. That's one area never to ask me questions about is biostatistics and statistical programming. Oh, it's definitely a doozy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Kristen, I know we're all working from home right now. And this is, this is probably as much of teamwork as we're getting, you know, in terms of togetherness. But do you typically find that you're working kind of on your own very autonomously or are you working more collaborative or is it a mix? How does, how does that work? It's going to depend on your task. Um, of course, um, I'll kind of use that audit again as an example. That's going to be a much mm -hmm. more collaborative approach because, again, I'm working across all the cross-functional areas to make sure everything is audit ready, all documentation is in place. So that is going to be more collaborative. However, you look at more of my day-to-day -day operations, which might be more of those uh, reporting uh forecasting, as well as getting ready for maybe a risk management meeting, those are going to be a lot more individual. And I'll just come to the plate with, all right, here's what we got um, and present that. Got it. Got it. Okay. So Grace, it, it sounds like your role is similar in terms of autonomy versus, you know, collaborative type work, but I'm curious if you, if you think about your day-to-day -day activities, and I'm getting the gist from all three of you that there is no typical day, um, how much of your time would you say is spent, I'm doing emails, I'm on the phone, I'm in meetings, or I'm doing other stuff? And what is that other stuff? So shockingly, I don't have a ton of meetings, which thank goodness, um, I have my team meetings with my um, clinical operations leader and the others clinical research associates on my mm -hmm. study team on a weekly basis or a bi weekly basis. Um, but I also have regular remote site management contacts with each of my sites. And that can take up a lot of time. So these are phone calls that I'm having with my sites on a weekly bi weekly or monthly basis that can last anywhere from five to 30 minutes. Um, and so I probably have 30 sites at this point. Mm -hmm. And so having to be in constant contact with each of them does take up a large majority of my time. Um, but also uh, another thing is that I'm always sending emails, which I know I try to limit how many emails I send per day because I do not want that to take up all of my time. So I do try to reserve um, sending emails for the early mornings when I first log on and the late afternoons so that I am making sure to respond within 24 hours of receiving all emails. Got it. So I'm also getting the impression that regardless of the role or the company, the work that the three of you are doing requires you to be pretty organized, be able to prioritize, kind of manage your time and activities. Would you guys agree with that? Absolutely, we're always right. juggling everything. <laughs> Got it. Got it. So then Victoria, who's in charge of your schedule? Like who, who makes your schedule and tells you, you know, what do you do? When do you go to lunch? Do you have people that report to you or you know, how does, how does that part work? Yes, yeah, so I am very thankful in the fact that I make my own schedule. Obviously, I'm a full-time employee, so I have to have 40 hours a week. But I also am a full-time student at UNCW, so go see <laughs> Um, So I'm very thankful that my line manager allows me to work extra hours, maybe in the early mornings or at night to fill those voids if I'm at class during the day or if I need to take a little time to take notes. Okay. But uh, definitely, I try to make myself available during the nine to five area, because I do have interns under me. So I mm -hmm. have to be there to corral those and grow them and mentor them. So I try to make myself available at all times, but really focus my schedule at the nine to five area.
Great, great. All right, so I have a question I'm gonna throw out to all three of you. Um, this one's coming in from the chat and it's what experience with regulatory affairs and quality management do any of you have? And what do you find to be challenging about that area of the work? Do you mean like before we got into the industry or now that we're in so the industry? So right now in the industry, in your roles, what experience do you have with regulatory affairs, um, whether it's IRB submissions, regulatory packages, or quality management, um, so issue management, corrective action, preventative action, what, what types of things are you doing there and what do you find challenging about it? I can go first since I asked the Please. question. <laughs> um, again, it's one of the cross-functional areas that I do kind of touch in. You know, a lot of my experience with regulatory affair affairs is making sure that our TMF or trial master file is really up to date as we can be with all of the appropriate documentation we get from the IRB or investigational review board. Um, and making sure that everything is good to go. Luckily, I've only really dealt with a central IRB. I haven't had to deal as much with uh, local IRBs or specific institutions IRBs that they work with because I know that can be a different ball game. Um, but really, a lot of my tasks involved have been, you know, really making sure everything is documented. And sometimes I am a part of the submission process, but I do know it can be a doozy. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Victoria, Grace. Oh, I can guess. So a part of my role as a PDA is I'm in charge of sending out any regulatory documents to the site. So that involves the 1572 uh, um, consulting agreements and stuff like that. So that's pretty much the scope of my um, experience with regulatory documents, although we do have deal with some with the centralized IRBs and making sure everything compliant. We do ETMF compliant. So that's something else I'm in charge of. Okay. ETMF. Electronic trial master file. Okay. And what in the heck is that? So it's all the documentation that we have for the study. We make sure that we have everything documented so it can be auditable and we can send it out to the sponsor at, its, at close out if we need to. And mm -hmm. we just make sure everything's up to date and in compliance. Grace, anything to add? Yeah, so um, we also mentioned quality management, and so I did want to bring up that a little bit. So thank goodness I've only had to raise one quality issue since I started at ParXL. Granted, I've only been here for two years, so I guess that's, you know, to be expected at this point in time. Um, but the quality issue is related to missing temperature logs for a, for a study um, for a specific site, and they had no documentation of the temperature logs from like 2015. Um, <laughs> yes, and so re resolving that in 2020, 2021 was a lot of fun. Um, so what we had to do is make sure um, had the site document that no, there were no temperature excursions during that time. Why did they not um, have their temperature logs and why did they not maintain them during that time period and what we can do in order to prevent this issue from recurring in the future. So that's that corrective action, corrective action and preventative action there, CAPA as we like to call it. Um, so there you go for quality management. Awesome. Awesome. All right. I've got a couple other questions that I'm going to toss out to you um, that have come in through the chat as well. Um, one of them being what would be your recommendations for folks who want to get their feet in the door in the industry? Maybe they're making a career change. Maybe they've been research coordinators or study coordinators previously. Um, but they're finding that they are, are having trouble because they don't have any clinical research experience. What words of wisdom or advice would you give them? Victoria? I would definitely recommend to continue on trying. There's always a position that you're able to fit in with your past transferable skills. For example, we have people at Farpoint that have their masters in business who used to be writers, you know, used to be in the military. All those leadership positions and those, you know, communicative skills 
transferable skills will help you greatly, even if you haven't had experience specifically in clinical research. Absolutely. Kristen, anything to add there? Network as much as you can. Um, a lot of the way that I got into the industry was um, knowing recruiters and messaging them on LinkedIn saying, mm -hmm. hey, remember me? Are there any open positions? I saw this, this, this. Absolutely. Um, Grace, any words of wisdom from you? Yep, just piggyback, piggybacking off of Kristen, just network, network, network. It's all about connections. Um, you'll find connections in the least likely of places. So really do try to um, rely on those as much as possible. But I, I started off as a clinical operations assistant with no experience in the industry. I only had a bachelor's degree. It was not in STEM. So it is possible for you to get into the industry, I promise. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I would just echo what these, these ladies have said, you know, apply for jobs be thoughtful about the career path. And if you don't know um, what that career path looks like, find someone who's got some experience under your belt. You've got these wonderful individuals here. You've got me, Vivian, um, you know, network, build your network within LinkedIn and professional organizations like SOPRA, ACRP, get to know folks and, and let people know this is, what I want to be doing, and here's why. Um, and it will happen for you. You just need to be persistent and and keep pursuing your 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 dream. Okay. In addition, you do really want to demonstrate how your skills and education and experience that you currently have can transfer into the clinical research industry as much as possible. Really read that job description that you're applying for and seeing how you can match up what your current skill set set is mm -hmm. and the experience that you have with what you're trying to accomplish in this new role. Absolutely, absolutely. So Vivian, did you want to share something? Sorry, um, unmute. There are a number of questions that have come in. Mm -hmm. Are you okay to have some now? Cause we're up to- like, Absolutely, absolutely. I thought, it, I thought it might be really useful to, to interject with some of them. So um, the first question is, do additional certifications such as CCRA or ACRP matter in getting your first job position? Ladies? I don't have a certification. Um, I don't have a certification. <laughs> so I'm going to say no. Nope. Got all of my training from Park Cell. <laughs> it really just, you have to find a program that will help grow you as an individual. The certification don't really matter that much as long as you have the skills to back up, you know, your job and what you can do. Yeah, I, I think the other piece around it in terms of a CCRA, which is the ACRP certification, you have to have a certain number of hours of experience. It equates to about 18 to 24 months of CRA experience to even sit for that exam. Um, so to get an entry level position, that certainly isn't isn't a likely um, combination, right? There are programs out there, whether they be university programs or certificate programs that you can go through um, to help prepare you. You wanna make sure that what you're getting is robust, that you can demonstrate that back to any future employer um, and that, that it is an accredited kind of reputable organization right, that you're going through to get that training, okay? And just to piggyback a little bit, your company might also help support you in getting your certifications because, for instance, I'm two years in as a project specialist, and I am considering getting my um, CAPM, which is a Certified Associate Project Manager certification, mm -hmm. um, which I know my company will help me out, at least with uh, the training and taking modules in pre preparation for that exam. Exactly, exactly. All right, are you ready for another question? Sure. So this, this one got several votes. Um, I'm a single mother and would like to hear more about the traveling expectations. Is it a few days at a time out of town or more like a week out of town? And mm -hmm. how often do you travel out of town? All right, this sounds like a CRA question. 
All right. Um, so for Par Excel, the expectation is that you're on site at least five days a month. So that really isn't that terrible. Um, <laughs> but for me, I always go a little bit too above and beyond. Um, sometimes 10 days on site a month, 11 days on site a month. Um, but there is a CRA incentive plan at Par Excel where they do um, give you a bonus if you go over 15 visits on site in a quarter. So that is something definitely to keep in mind. It's super awesome. Um, but also just making sure that even if you do take on those extra visits, that you're still on top of your remote site management responsibilities. Yeah, and I, I will say um, to the person that asked that question, each CRO sort of has a different, um, a different target for that, right? So CRA A, it may be you need to be on site 50% of your time, 70% of your time, and CRA or CRO B may say, five visits a month or eight visits a month. And it, it really depends. The um, number of visits does not always equate to the number of days away from home either. Um, certainly today with travel being slightly less available um, than it used to be, you know, even two years ago, sometimes getting from point A to point B takes a little bit longer. Um, so there are great questions, but it's really going to be very dependent on the organization. There are, however, non-traveling roles within the CRO industry, and you've got two great examples here, the project team associate, the project specialist role. Do you, either of you, Victoria or Kristen, travel in your role frequently? No, I don't travel frequently at all. Every now and then I go up to our office based out of Durham. And then if I get if I get additional studies and those sites are nearby, I might go out to mm -hmm. those sites. But definitely for the PTA role, CTA role, not much traveling is needed or required, if any at all. Okay. Same here. Do not travel very often. The only thing I would travel for would be any sort of like sponsor meeting where I have to travel mm -hmm. to the sponsor um, and or an investigator meeting. Uh, but okay. those happen every maybe once a quarter or even every six months. Okay. Good I also um, wanted to add that we do have remote monitoring visits or remote initiation visits, qualification visits, things of that nature. And the remote visits count as one third of an on-site visit. So it doesn't count as much, but it is there as another option. Um, we also have the initi initiation clinical research associate role and they are responsible for doing everything from the um, site selection to um, the initiation visit, and they do absolutely no traveling. So that's another option if you're interested. Okay, and I, I think in some companies, those are called in-house CRAs, right? Yep. Is, at Farpoint or Cineos, what are they called? Um, I do site feasibility and initiation. So okay. we have CRAs that go to the sites for those original SIVs, but for all the document collection and feasibility and stuff, the PTAs would do those, at least at far point. Got it. And I believe for us, those would be our central monitoring associates. They do the kind okay. of site monitoring calls and all the things, but they're in-house. Got it, got it. So, so hopefully, here, hopefully that answered that question. Sorry, Vivian. That's okay, we've got a lot of them. So mm -hmm. I might interject. So this is another great one. Can you share what the interview process was like for you? Oh, absolutely. I loved my interview. So Farpoint really tests applicants on really their enthusiasm, their innovation, their creativeness, their ability to want to learn. That's a huge thing. And I know a lot of my interview was based on, you know, logic-based questions, riddles that I had to solve. Obviously, there's some functional skills that they test as well, but the you know, they really test your problem, solve, problem solving abilities and whatnot. Great. Anyone else? Mine was um, pretty standard. I went with the uh, first talk to the recruiter and then I met with two managers and someone else who was in the role. Uh, a lot of it was just really easy flow communication. Of course, you do a lot of the homework beforehand you know, I researched a lot about the company, researched a lot about the role I was applying for, talked to a few 
people that I knew in the role at other companies and just kind of was like, hey, what are your day to day? The favorite question. Um, mm. What, you know, what do you think I should know going into this? Uh, again, networking. Um, and then really kind of just made the conversation very easy flowing. Um, and again, it was testing, you know, the problem solving skills, organization skills and prioritizing. So if you're ready, we'll keep going. Um, I like this question as well. Um, first of all, they started off with a thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Are there many people at your company with masters or PhDs? If so, are they part of your team? And what job titles tend to require those degrees? So I, there are, a few people that have their masters. I'm going to be getting my masters and I'm hopefully going to move to the CRA PM role, but in clinical, our directors and associate directors have their masters. We also have project managers that have their masters. In statistics, we have stat programmers that have their master's degree, uh, biostatisticians that have their masters and their PhD, and same with data management. So it really is all levels of individuals and colleagues that I have that have their masters and PhDs and just regular old um, bachelor's degrees as well. Yeah, no, I, I would echo that same sentiment where most of the people who have those master's degrees are in project leadership. And also as you move further up the ladder, I mean, you look at executive and C-suite, I mean, those, those are definitely going to have those master's degrees. Um, and I do notice that the, the medical monitors have PhDs. And so they represent both the, um, they work with both the sponsor and the CRO by ask, um, answering all medical related questions um, that the sites have. Yeah, so the, the medical monitors do have, a lot of them have that dual MD, PhD. Um, and I, I do just want to interject that the, the degree level piece is actually very different if we were to look at Europe. Um, a lot of the CRAs in Europe have master's degrees, PhDs, um, MDs. So it, it's not unusual. Um, and it, it is really a good mix. I've worked within academic settings, CRO and, and biotech settings. Um, it, it really varies greatly. I think what Victoria shared that the folks that are in the biostats group tend to be the you know minimum masters in science, but often PhD level folks. Um, so the next question is someone is wondering about their nursing experience skills and how that may be transferable to a job in clinical research. Ask Jamie. <laughs> yes, I'm going to give you all the feels as a nurse. Okay. Um, so definitely it's transferable skills. I think the, the piece to fill the gap between the two is the research component. If you've worked in a clinical setting, you get the clinical piece, you get the documentation, you get the patient safety aspect, all the terminology, it's not going to be foreign to you. But there's a big difference in the, the practice of medicine or nursing and the conduct of research. So I would really encourage you to think about looking for like study coordinator, clinical research coordinator roles to get your feet into research first, but it's, it's a great transition. And a lot of nurses have made that jump. Next question is with the master's in clinical research, what positions would be more suitable than just entry level or would entry level still be your only option? So, you know, your master's is having, having your master's is great, but you really need that experience in working. So I recommend, you know, getting an internship. It doesn't have to be an unpaid internship. There's lots of companies offer paid internships, mm -hmm. but really developing your skills in clinical research beyond the classroom will help you advance. Um, once you get that experience, uh, industry level, you could go in PTA, CRA, uh, in the clinical field, but Beyond that, project management, if you have those leadership mm -hmm. skills, 
go into study coordination. You can do lots of things with your master's degree. You're not very limited at all. So a question you've heard a lot, what should a newly, a new graduate do if all the positions interested in require two to three years of experience? Should they still apply? I say shoot your shot, <laughs> see how it exactly. goes. Um, and follow up with, like, you know, I'm a huge, coming from that recruiting staffing background, I'm a huge supporter in, you know, taking your LinkedIn and reaching out to a few recruiters that are at that company saying like, hey, I applied to this job posting. Like, do you, do, would you have time to talk about it? Follow up. And I would another think I would like to add is that you don't have to have direct experience related to the industry. You could have transferable experience <laughs> that you can, you know, you know, stretch it a little bit, make it work, um, really just sell yourself. <laughs> Also, internships. Can't stress internships enough. Internships will give you that experience, and you don't have to have entry-level experience to it. You'll still have direct and indirect experience with the clinical research side and studies. Yeah, I think we're going to see Victoria on an internship poster very soon, coming from I NC Biotechnology it. Center. Yes. So the follow-on, of course, is how do you get internships? And, and um, how do you become aware of internship availability? Yeah, so at least at Farpoint, we have internship programs at a lot of different universities. We have one at UNCW. We have some at NC State, Chapel Hill, um, Campbell. There are a lot of opportunities for internships that you can get just through connections in your program. So mm -hmm. we have the math and science connections, uh, within the university's uh, clinical research connections as well. So you just have to ask people about it. Also, if you go on any of the websites, LinkedIn, you can find internship opportunities there. And if any more questions about internships, you can also reach out to me and I can connect you with HR with that. We love internships. Absolutely. And I, I think a lot of companies will also post their internships as job postings, right? Um, the Association of Clinical Research Professionals, ACRPNet.org, also has a place where they list open and available internships, um, and not just for clinical research associate roles, but for roles within the industry. Um, but again, I think each of these ladies has said the networking component, connecting with people, reaching out and, and asking for what you want, right? It's, it's, a, big, it's a big step, right? Um, but be direct and say, you know, I'm interested in how, how can I get there? Ask for some mentoring, um, just make those connections. So this is a good question for you, Jamie. Um, it is, I am a junior at UC, uh, UNCW majoring in clinical research. My mother actually works for Prexel and <laughs> says I should start applying for jobs now. What entry level jobs would you recommend for a recent graduate that would help me become a CRA and how soon should I apply for those jobs? Well, I'll tell you, Prexel has got some pretty awesome um, new things coming um, around an emerging CRA program that is very similar to what you heard Grace describe, um, where we're going to put people through the training to become a CRA, fast track them into that role. And it's, it's really a great opportunity. There's also opportunities for career changers. So depending on, you know, what transferable skills you have, if you're coming from a research coordinator or, you know, maybe you were a project manager in a manufacturing plant. You may have skills that would be perfect for different roles within a CRO or, or pharma company. Um, so I would say absolutely start getting connected, getting to know the recruiters. Um, and I see Kristen starting to nod her head. Um, they can be huge advocates. Make your connections to folks within the companies that you are interested in. Um, you can absolutely connect with me. I will not turn down any LinkedIn connections. Um, if you apply now, one of the questions that you'll get asked in a screening interview is when could you start and what's your availability? Depending on what your program is, if you weren't able to immediately work full time, 
it might it might be a um, a challenge, okay? But I wouldn't hesitate to go ahead and start making those connections. So this this is another good one. Um, it says the field has changed a lot in thirteen years. I used to work in a foreign country as a clinical research coordinator, but want to get back in the industry. How do I go about it? I'm trying to connect, but people are busy. What's the best way to connect? A lot has changed in 13 years. Um, wow. So I would definitely look for some type of program to refresh your GCP skills, maybe attend some conferences to get a better sense of the technology um, and how that's impacting things now. Even just in the last two years, I think our industry has changed so much. Um, I, th I think whatever refresher program you can find that, that can get you where you need to be, to be a, a competitive candidate, your prior experience is not for naught. It will help you, um, but you certainly need to demonstrate that you're you know, up to the current standard. Um, another one, uh, many positions are denoted with FSP in the mm -hmm. job title. Can you please elaborate on the differences between full service slash full time versus the functional service provision model? Any of you guys want to do that? Kristen? I don't have a full concept on it as much as I'd like to. I'm like, ah. <laughs> okay, so if anyone from Par Excel FSP is on this call, I'm sure I'm going to get an instant message or a call um, tomorrow morning to tell me that I've lost my mind. But the way that I learned how to differentiate or how to understand an FSP model versus a full service, okay, model is full services, we're basically gonna do everything. So the sponsor, and we're gonna use our COVID vaccine trial with Moderna. Moderna gives us the study to conduct. We're doing the project management, the data management, the clinical monitoring, all of it, okay? With a functional service provider type model, that's like going to a cafeteria style restaurant, okay? I'm going to pick my entree and my dessert, but I'm not getting the salad and I'm not getting the bread, okay? It is a way that a sponsor organization can quickly scale up their um, workforce in a particular function or a different geography, okay? Hopefully that helps you understand that. Now, when you think about a FSP model, um, a lot of times those are what we call embedded models where you might be working for Par Excel, but you have a client or a sponsor computer, you're using the client's systems, you're using all of their processes, their standard operating procedures. So it's almost like you're working for them but you're working through Par Excel. So I hope that makes sense, but feel free to, you know, post any additional questions. And just to kind of like piggyback a little bit, like they're going to be your sole focus, that sponsor. For mm -hmm. instance, I'm on two separate studies for two separate sponsors. Um, but when you're on that kind of FSP, you're going to be solely focused on making that sponsor happy, functioning yeah. and well-organized. Good. So another question, if anyone has R, comma, JPM analysis, or even Python entry-level coding experience, along with a PhD, are these enough to get a job as an R&D associate? As an R&D associate. So I guess that job title is a little bit misleading, maybe. I think with the with those particular skill sets, data analytics, data science, data mining, huge skill set right now that is in hot demand within the industry. Um, 
I think the big question would be what, what maybe experience do you have in clinical research? And if you didn't have any, how could you get some to make yourself much more marketable in that space? Because understanding clinical data analytics might be a little bit different than other types. And again, remember, I don't speak stats and programming and all that fun stuff. And Victoria is going to laugh at me. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely, those are really good foundations. I would also recommend trying to learn SAS. If you learn SAS 9.4, SAS can be huge help. With your PhD, that kind of scares me thinking that you would be a really good statistician, biostatistician, if you could teach yourself SAS. So that can give you a really good foundation for understanding the project, being able to help on and, you know, help your project when it needs. So definitely think about the biostatistician role. So just continuing on that theme, someone asked for new graduates in biostatistics, when does recruitment normally start um, in the clinical research world? Um, so if you're biostatistics, if you're going for that stat biostatistician role, biostatistician role, I would highly recommend possibly thinking of you for you to pursue your master's or any graduate degree. That's going to kind of push you in that statistician role. Although if you're doing just, you can go into the stat programmer role, you can go into database programmer, any data analytics, entry level position, you just have to apply and get your foot in the door that way, network as we've so far pushed. But definitely just getting yourself into that stat programming role would help you out greatly. Good. Um, next question. So besides strong networking skills, what other characteristics make a good candidate when applying for a job or an internship? I think displaying your organizational skills, uh, time management skills are a huge one. Um, sorry, my cat just scared herself. Um, being a kind of flexible and being able to articulate what you have done in the past that can be, you know, transferred into this role. Sorry, my cat just really distracted me. <laughs> Working from home is so great. <laughs> Any, anything else from any of the other panelists? I know people always say communication skills, but I think that in the CRA role, it is really vital because you're talking to people that have all different levels of experience and education. So I'm, I have a bachelor's degree and I'm talking to API who is a medical doctor and he's been practicing for 30 years. How am I going to be up to snuff talking to this highly experienced, highly educated individual I just have to be very confident with what I'm saying and know my stuff. So it's it's just how would how would you go about communicating with someone who has a different level of experience or education level than you, and also talking to people who may not understand uh, what clinical research is. So just you know communication skills go above and beyond communicating how you are able to use those in a variety of different settings with a variety of different in, different individuals. Absolutely. And showing initiative is also a huge thing. So you really want to show that you're able to be, to grow in that company and to grow and learn more skills and to be able, be able to help out. You know, in the clinical research, your own, your growth is only limited by your willingness to grow. Absolutely. So showing that initiative will help you out so much. Absolutely, Victoria. I think the only thing I would add on to, to what you all have said is I, I deal with a lot of, you know, newcomers to the industry, career changers internally to ParXL, as well as outside of ParXL. And one piece of feedback that I consistently hear from management and supervisors around the globe is professional skills. And I think it's, it's sort of been circled, right, with the communication and you know, that sort of thing, but being professional, take things seriously, especially if you are, you know, looking for your first real, you know, I'm starting my career in something kind of job. Um, you know, that 
that level of business etiquette that maybe you've not been exposed to previously. And I, I don't know, Victoria, Grace, Kristen, if you can speak to that, kind of what that is or feels like. I'm a huge fan of mock interviews before you actually do the interview. Um, talk to either, you know, someone, a family member that might be in a business or professional community. Um, again, maybe someone uh, like a professor that you are close to or have a good relationship with, someone who is willing to sit down and give you pointers because I, I know my own tics. I'm in a side to side chair and I can easily move back and forth or a tick of mine used to be playing with rings. Mm -hmm. So you pick up on those things when you do a mock interview. All right. All right. So the next question is, can you elaborate on the clinical trials associate slash assistant role? Is it an entry level position? So I would definitely say that, yes, it is an entry-level position, but the I, I call it a clinical operations assistant role. And so that one is like very entry-level. And then I actually transferred from the clinical operations assistant role to the clinical um, research associate role. Um, and so both are considered entry-level, but one is you have some background experience in the clinical research industry and the other you don't as much. Um, so within the clinical operations assistant role, you have um, the ability to support study teams um, with clinical research associates and what their workload is. Um, so this could be filing documents in the trial master file, contacting sites to resolve um, TMF issues, so TMF quality issues. Um, this could be working on investigator payments. It can be anything. And it really just gives you a really great foundation of knowledge in the clinical research industry and what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis on how to operate as a CRA. And then once you move into the clinical research associate role, you have that um, site management experience as I was describing, describing earlier on with that source data review and verification, doing IP accountability, and then also remote site management and keeping up with what sites are doing on a day-to-day -day basis and how you can best support them. Um, and also making sure to always um, ensure the um, integrity of the data and patient safety at all times. Sorry, that was a mouthful. <laughs> Good. So um, next, are there any particular conferences you would recommend that support networking opportunities or sessions in the field? Great question. So conferences, I don't have that much experience on, but definitely career fairs. At, if you're in college, going to a career fair, more than likely in North Carolina, there's going to be a CRO there. So you'll be able to network at those places, at those fairs, you'll be able to get your foot in the door, you know, make those connections. So definitely recommend the career fairs. So I'll, I'll comment on the, um, on the conference component. So first and foremost, I would say ACRP and SOCRA are kind of like the recognized professional organizations for this industry, okay? Um, ACRP, RTP is getting ready to go through a major, you know, reboot and get super active. And we're definitely gonna be looking for new membership. So if you're in the RTP area, come and have a great time with us. We will be doing a lot of virtual networking but once things settle back down a bit, we'd love to be in person. And we used to do a lot of um, in-person conferences. Um, I think October of 2019, we had a big Southeast um, regional conference in Durham at the Sheraton Imperial. Fantastic opportunity. Two days of learning, networking, collaborating, and it's, it's greatly missed, right? So I think first and foremost, get involved with local chapters, local organizations. You can even participate in some of those functions as non-members. Um, so it goes back to the networking piece. So can you talk about work-life balance in your roles and also those, uh, also specifically for entry-level positions? Uh, 
So I uh, have to say that that is the thing that I struggle with the app uh, the, the most. Okay. Um, but what you really have to do is plan your hours. So I'm going to start work at eight o'clock and I will get done at four <laughs> and try as hard as possible to really have that cutoff time and make sure you make time for yourself and for your family and your loved ones. Um, but you know what, as long as you're getting everything that you need done during the week, whether it's 40 hours or, you know, for me, sometimes it's 50 hours, um, just really making sure that you do set, set aside time for yourself and um, while also getting all of your responsibilities completed. Absolutely. And from, you know, I know we have a lot of students on the call. From that student perspective, about having that good time management skills and good time management background to balance your full-time student uh, duties and full-time employment is a huge thing and also while maintaining extracurriculars. So I really stress time management. I know I use planners. I use that Outlook app, um, which is a huge help to me. So I would highly recommend, you know, just getting your affairs in order ahead of time. So if I plan a week ahead, you know, you just having that time management is a huge thing. And I think working from home, it can get a little blended when your day just doesn't end because you're not leaving the office. Um, so I kind of when we started shifting working from home and I will probably be work from home moving forward is I really do block out you know, an hour at lunch to go take a walk, get out of my house or really do things, plan things for in the afternoon that I know I, I want to do. Like I will commit to going to the gym. I will commit to going to the grocery store. I will commit to go doing this. Um, that way you are taking that mental break. And sometimes I also mute my phone. I will get rid of the notification of an email because I'm like, nope, I don't want it. <laughs> I think one of the one of the things that I noticed that that Par Excel did um, this year was pilot summer hours um, between what was it Memorial Day and Labor Day, so that you know if you were kind of hitting that forty hour, fifty hour mark by noon on Fridays and everything was caught up, you could sign off and enjoy a little bit of downtime. Um, and that even extended to allow for Monday mornings could even be where you took that that summer hourage. Um, but also no meeting Fridays is something else that was was implemented. And that has really it has really allowed us to, I think, take Fridays to focus on clearing things up so that we're not going into that rest period of our weeks completely overwhelmed and stressed. Because as Kristen said, you can't turn it off when you're at home. So um, also related to this is, are there positions which are home-based positions if you're not interested in traveling and you prefer to work from home? Most of the entry level like positions that I went into, like I was a project associate at PRA and now a project specialist at Cineos Health, um, all those had the opportunity to work from home after a certain amount of time within the company and within the role. And even being a project specialist uh, now for two years, um, because I've been here for that certain amount of time, I have the option to completely work from home with approval from my manager based off of my performance. So it might not be something coming in entry level where you get right off the bat, but it is something you could work towards within maybe three months, six months, 12 months. And I will say in today's climate with the pandemic, uh, employers are a lot more accommodating to working remotely just to be safe and take those proper precautions. I know at far point we can come into the office, but we have to wear the mask and we have to be, you know, have those precautions and be conscious and be safe. But, you know, we are, a lot of people have moved to remote or partially remote or fully remote because of the pandemic. So would the size of a CRO affect the social and working environment you, you expect? So is there a differential based on the size of the CRO you work for? So coming from the mid-size CRO standpoint, we are very collaborative between departments. You know, I can, if I have a question, let's say about a proposal, I, can, I know people and I have friends in the proposals department that I can reach out to. If I want to get my intern more experience on the statistics side, 
I can reach out to someone in stats and ask them if they have anything that they can help with. You know, it really is just a very collaborative atmosphere here, and you know, we really push that. You know, we want to be a team, we want to be a family, as cliche as that sounds, but that is something that will really help you enjoy your work atmosphere. I know something like it's a, it's been kind of interesting one coming from like the pandemic working with my team. Sometimes I'm like, wait, who's project specialists again? Um, we, when we have our monthly calls or something like that, or even mentoring new project specialists. Um, but I do say like, there is definitely that collaborative approach where I think everyone is willing to help you. I've never really run across a point with talking across other functional departments where they're just like, nope, sorry. Um, they might say, oh, hey, I'm busy, but put something on my calendar for this time. Um, so there's never really been an issue of not having someone that's willing to help out and be collaborative with you. And I would also like to add that there are um, committees that you can get involved in within your company. And so I personally am a part of Park Excel Pride and our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, where I am the uh, co-chairs for our LGBTQ plus subcommittee. That's great. So one thing is advice on creating a strong LinkedIn profile, as well as any suggestions on LinkedIn etiquette. In terms of the LinkedIn etiquette with maybe messaging recruiters, I would maybe keep it to a simple, you know, three to five sentences. Hi, my name is so and so. I have this background. I'm really looking kind of into this role. Would you have time to chat? Um, I can be, I can be free this day, this day. I'm a huge advocate of go ahead and say up front when you're free. That way, you're cutting out at least maybe two replies of being like, Hey, when are you free? When are you free? Um, and then, in terms of your profile, make sure it's accurate. Um, probably five bullet points that relate to the industry that you're trying to get into. Again, that transferable skills that we've been talking about and make sure you're highlighting the key points of, you know, organized time management, um, communication, things like that. I think one of my biggest pet peeves um, when I'm looking at something as a hiring manager um, is spelling is absolutely important, right? Your profile picture on social media speaks volumes, okay? Shouldn't be maybe the picture of you at the local bar on a Friday night, right? It's a professional, you know, representation of yourself. Um, customizing your, your profile kind of headlines and as well as your cover picture in the background, um, that, that just shows that you've got a little bit of, you know, creativity. It gives you an opportunity to kind of differentiate yourself from others. And believe me, recruiters and hiring managers are definitely looking. All right. For, I think for all the panelists, what was, what were your first months and or year on the job like? Was it as you had expected? or somehow different? What surprised you? So I'm very thankful, and I'm gonna say it again, my internship really prepared me for that full-time position. So we, I did that transition from the internship directly to the full-time once I graduated. Um, so it is, I will say, a little, at least I got a little anxious with my first project. You know, even though I was really well prepared, it still is this one thing you're in charge of. So it's a lot of responsibility that you maybe didn't have throughout your internship um, to that to the full extent. But I will say gaining confidence is a huge thing. Having the confidence to reach out to someone and say, oh, maybe this doesn't look right. Or, hey, I noticed that we're missing this. That is a huge thing. So confidence is really key with that first couple weeks or first year. And I remember thinking to myself, like the little bit of unstructured was 
a little difficult for me at first, just because I, I am a very much type A person. I like having my day to day, everything kind of outlined. So I did have to, you know, adjust my mentality a little bit coming in, but I found my structure through other ways of, I am an extreme color coder. I love everything outlook color coding. Um, same thing with making sure my email is organized at the end of every day. So I feel prepared. Um, so it was channeling that type A into other things so that I wasn't as frustrated sometimes with the lack of structure. Grace, do you want to add anything? Sorry, I missed the question. Oh, no, that's okay. It's a long day and a long yeah. night. <laughs> no, my, my internet cut out. So I have, I don't know no. what, what the question was. <laughs> no problem. Um, it was just what surprised you in your first months or your first year at work. Um, was so it as I, you expected? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest things that I was not prepared for is the number of standard operating procedures that Parkdale <laughs> has, and it is, it's daunting. Um, I'm still learning something new every single day, and there's no way any, anyone could remember every single SOP out there, um, but knowing where to look and how to find the answers, that's the, that's the real key. And also all of the different systems and vendors that Parkdale uses, I'm still not an expert in all of them and they don't expect you to be. Um, another great thing that Parkzill has is they have uh, super users that you can contact and they're able to provide you with support on different um, things that you're struggling with, whether it be um, a SOP or a process within a certain um, vendor or system that we use and they're super helpful and easy to contact. Be prepared your first three weeks reading SOPs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that's definitely not unique to Par Excel. No, it's, <laughs> it's training, training, training day after day for the first, like, I don't know, month. So, and then you continue to have trainings. So, nonstop, never stop learning. <laughs> so, there's a, there are more questions. We'll probably go for another five minutes. Um, the one there's a couple in here around the same theme so i'm just going to direct them all at once there are a number of people who are looking at doing a transition so they may have worked in the lab for a while or they've worked in doing um, preclinical based work but they're interested in transitioning into clinical research mm -hmm. so do you have any specific suggestions for them either on how to integrate or find out about positions or what type of positions would be appropriate Definitely identifying those transitionable skills is a huge aspect. I would recommend doing a lot of research. Yeah, just a quick Google search, uh, CRO position would help you and give you a lot of background research on maybe some, not all the specific positions, because there are a lot of company specific positions that you could, you know, oh, maybe my communication skills will help me excel at this position. Um, also, reach, looking out on LinkedIn, maybe CROs in your area that are hiring, looking out at what they're looking for, what skills they're looking for to, for the various positions would be a huge help. Great. Uh, another thing would be networking with other professionals within the industry so that you can learn more about what it is on their, how their day-to-day -day operations work. And also joining organizations like we mentioned earlier, like ACRP or SOCRA, just to familiarize yourself with the differences between preclinical work and also current clinical work. Um, so someone asked if it would be all right if um, the pan uh, sorry the attendees the audience have asked if it'd be all right to reach out to the panelists if they have specific questions through LinkedIn or email um, would would that be okay with with all of you? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> I would love it. Oh, that's great. They kind um, of asked for it, didn't they, Vivian? I mean, yeah, they've been saying <laughs> network, network, network. <laughs> that, but it was really still a very good question that was asked, and it's a very smart question as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one question is, is there any way to do volunteer work in clinical research to gain experience? Yes. I know at Farpoint, Volunteer-wise, we would probably take administrative assistance. That would be a really good way to get yourself acquainted with just the atmosphere of the company. It would also get you a look at the different departments and see if you 
were interested in one department over the other or if anything really stood out to you? I think it would also be great just to reach out to some professionals within the industry to see if they would be willing to let you shadow to see what their day-to-day -day mm -hmm. looks like. I mean, some people are definitely more willing than others. And obviously things are a little bit strange with all of us working remotely. Um, but if you wanted to hop on on one of their calls just to see what their day-to-day -day looks like, that would not be, I wouldn't hesitate to ask. I'm going to put my, my blinkers up here and just say all of this with the caveat of it would be up to the discretion of the organization and any client. Um, so you likely would not be able to go and dive into a clinical trial. No. Okay. <laughs> but but you would you would be able to, you know, get some exposure to what's it like in that environment, what it, you know, what's it feel like? Um, because everything, everything that these guys, these ladies are are doing on a day-to-day -day basis is really under a lot of confidentiality um, structure. Makes sense, good. Um, I, I'll try two more questions. Um, would it be better to start in the CRO role then move to a CRC role or vice versa? It all depends on your experience and what you're interested in. So yeah, that's really my answer to that. It really all depends on your preferences on things what skills you have, what background you have. It really all is, is just dependent on the person. I yeah, know I definitely have seen people do both. And so it really just depends on what your end goal is and what you want um, to accomplish in your career in clinical research. Last question of the night. Um, does, um, how long can you expect to still be training when you take a new position? You never stop training. <laughs> um, I just took a continuing education workshop today on good documentation practices. So it's, it's something to be expected throughout your entire career. Um, but when you're first doing your onboarding training, I think I was doing onboarding training for about a month in my um, current role. And every company is a little bit different on like their onboarding training and kind of the setup that they have. Like when I onboarded, it was uh, three full days of, you know, getting to know the company and then you got to know the role and then you got to know your team and then, you know, the SOPs, you're assigned a mentor, those types of programs. So they do set, like companies will set you up for success for at least, you know, that probably three to six month time period. I have mentees that have been with the company now over 90 days that I still check in with about mm -hmm. once every two weeks, like, how's it going? Are you surviving? Um, and then, you know, and I always tell them I'll be a point of contact even afterwards. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to give a very big shout out and thanks to the moderator and the panelists and all of you who joined tonight. Um, you had some excellent questions and this, these panelists and Jamie did a fantastic job answering them. If you want more information about early careers in clinical research and about North Carolina CROs, please visit ncbiotech.org slash CRO. Also, please keep your eye on your email and our event calendar to register for the next conversation coming up on October 13th. So again, thank you very much, Victoria, Kristen, Grace, and Jamie for your time tonight and the audience for attending. And y'all have a wonderful evening. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Good Thank luck. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.